before we go into the verse it is called bhakti yoga this is again a place where there is a lot of confusion bhakti yoga the is the name of the chapter and in fact we think that the whole bhagavad gita when vyasa wrote it was not divided into chapters at all that is a later <coughs> interpolation for ease of understanding people divided that into chapters based on the topic etc you see it came later it was not there before and in the vedantic community there is a uh, there is an abiding feeling of many paths to the same goal and what is the goal moksha moksha and so moksha can be gained through karma and that path is called karma yoga moksha can be gained through bhakti this is the feeling that is called bhakti yoga moksha can be gained through knowledge also that is called gnana yoga and if nothing else works there is always hatha yoga raja yoga whatever it is called and this is the abiding feeling and i don't know how this came about really but that is not what is being talked about here and somebody also said that since the bhagavad gita has 18 chapters and each one is called yoga 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 arjuna vishada yoga Sankhya Yoga, second chapter. Karma Yoga, third chapter. Karma Sanyasa Yoga, fourth chapter. Sanyasa Yoga, you know, uh, fifth chapter. Dhyana Yoga, sixth chapter. Like this, they thought that some people, one, one, per, one particular school of thought says that there are 18 ways to get moksha. And if that's really the case, Arjuna Vishada Yoga means the sorrow of Arjuna. So that means sorrow is the way to gain moksha. Really, this is not, this is not the correct thing. And this has to be properly understood. Here, the word yoga means the name of a chapter, Sangati, the context of the chapter. So that is what it is. and when we talk about karma yoga we don't mean the context of karma no we mean a committed lifestyle which is conducive for assimilating the knowledge that one studies sankhya yoga sanyasa is another yoga another committed lifestyle which is conducive to gain the knowledge that's all it is knowledge is important and not you know because the problem is one of self ignorance please understand the problem is not of being separated from something in time or in place if you are separated something from time or in place then you need karma you need everything different things but here the problem is that the seeker is the sort and doesn't know it so brahman or the understanding of bhagavan is separated from you why 
how not for not for time or space but because of not understanding the separating factor between myself and the whole that i am seeking to gain is ignorance the truth is the gain of brahman is within quotes because it's an as though gain it's already gained it's gained and then it's recognized that's why we have the word recognized because it's already there and it is cognized within oneself as the truth of the entire universe so this is what it is bhakti is not a separate path because it's not separate from karma what will the bhakti how will the bhakti yogi if there is a bhakti yogi what is the bhakti go, yogi going to do tell me yogi here means if committed lifestyle of bhakti is indeed what is meant what will the person do they sit and do bhajans let us say that is karma correct <laughs> yeah <laughs> bhajan is action you know mm-hmm. verbal action uh, you know vachikam karma no 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 we will sit and meditate that is also a karma manasam karma mental activity now we will sit and do puja that is again ritualized karma so ritual so really speaking the bhakti yogi is resorting to karma to express the bhakti and the karma yogi is to is advised to do all actions with bhakti with devotion so the karma yogi whether the karma yogi is in the prayer room or at the church or at the temple or at the job or at home or in the kitchen or anywhere or washing the car is told to do all these actions worshipfully with bhakti and the bhakti yogi if there is such a person needs karma to to be the vehicle of that expression of the bhakti you cannot just sit to sit quietly with bhakti that is not what it is even sitting quietly is an action so really speaking bhakti yoga is not a separate yoga for the sake of gaining moksha it's not a separate thing that is there and people say all kinds of things jnana yoga for the one who is intellectual if you are intellectual you like to sit in vedanta classes <laughs> and you want to you know you want to gain the knowledge that way and knowledge you know of moksha but if you are a restless type and if you are a, you know extrovert then you need karma yoga because you have to you know expand this restlessness if you are an introvert and an emotional type you need bhakti yoga people say this and we have to be very very clear that regardless of what regardless of the culture of you know the the the, the narrative that has built around all these so called yogas what the bhagavad gita's purport here the word yoga is used variously and we have to not get confused by the usage when it is at the beginning of the chapter it means sangati simply a title and when it is specially used like karma yoga sankhya yoga it is talking of a committed lifestyle a lifestyle to which you are joined yoga means bringing together a lifestyle the style to which you are joined you are committed to in order to gain what you need to gain which is freedom from samsara karma doesn't lead karma binds but karma yoga makes you a free person so that you can uh, you know that whatever is taught in the knowledge abides in the heart so the karma yogi is the one who is a lover of ishvara in the form of dharma really the karma yogi is not somebody who is just ethical because there are many people who are just ethical in the world they follow all the rules and they don't bring ishvara into the equation that is not a karma yogi a karma yogi is one who acknowledges the all the laws as manifestations of the source of the universe and acknowledges oneself also as ultimately non separate from the source which is yet to be known and in the meantime 
prepares one heart, uh, one's heart to rid itself of what is called what are called raga and dvesha. What are they? Likes and dislikes. Yeah, strong likes and dislikes, which mar the pursuits of pursuit of knowledge, because they stand in the way. They become part of the persona, which veil, which keep the person veiled. Yeah, because when you start believing in the persona, the person goes away, mm. goes into hiding. And so to unmask the person, first the persona has to be, you know, reduced and all the angularities, you know, ha have to be reduced. And therefore, the whole teaching is such that, you know, just like the, a, a, a jagged rock in the hands of the sculptor, because when the sculptor brings home that rock, he or she sees already there the potential what that rock can become and starts chipping away, chipping away, chipping away and a beautiful Krishna figurine is there. And then if you've just seen the person carry the rock and then suddenly six weeks later you go to their house and the sculptor house has this beautiful Krishna you know, figure and you say, oh, is, was, is this Krishna that rock? Yes, this is indeed that rock. Tattva Masi, <laughs> that indeed is this, you know. How, how did that rock become Krishna? The rock did not become Krishna. It was Krishna all along. It was discovered by chipping away of, of non-Krishna parts. Correct? <laughs> All that was non-Krishna was chiseled away and chipped away. And then there was Krishna in the form of this beautiful, you know, wonderful sculpture. And so too for this jiva, karma yoga means a committed lifestyle where one submits to the chipping away of everything that is non-Bhagavan. Yes, Anisha, non-Isha, win oneself to reveal that which is Isha. So beautiful. This is Karma Yoga where one attributes all their doing, the agency of the action is given up, is attributed to Ishvara, therefore Ishvara has to be kept in view firmly. And of course this cannot be done mechanically, it has to be done with devotion. So the agency is given up and whatever comes, the fruit of the action, the action is given up, the agency behind it is given up, so karta is given up and then the action, the fruit of the action which it yields of course comes from Ishvara and it is taken with a, you know, attitude, with an attitude of glad acceptance. And this is what we have to understand. It is taken with an attitude of glad acceptance. And this is what we want. And so, this is Karma Yoga. A committed lifestyle to chipping away at all the ragadveshas, the strong personality aspects of an individual, which comes in the way of knowing oneself. What is the connection to strong likes and dislikes that come in the way of, or how do they come in the way of knowing oneself? Because one is invested in those likes and dislikes. They hijack one from the pursuit. And as Krishna says in the second chapter, Prasabham Harati Manaha, with force they take the mind away. It's a big distraction. If it's constantly the mind is contemplating on everything else, one is confused. Like the teenagers right now, you know, they multitask. And five minutes even, they cannot hold their attention. And then you take them to the doctor and the doctor conveniently says ADD. <laughs> this is what? And where was this ADD in one AD? It wasn't there. <laughs> because we didn't have all these phones and, uh, you know, equipment and constantly doing something. You're updating something and then you're checking something and in the middle bit some ding ding sound, somebody is sending you some messages. You know, some ding ding. The phone is constantly doing something. And then you're also on the internet trying to watch something that somebody sent. It's a mess, you know. And so like this, the distractions are so many that if the likes and dislikes are not reduced, what happens is that the pursuit is hijacked. That is one reason. And second reason, 
to reduce the likes and dislikes is, is that if the likes and dislikes are there, they create a parallel personality. Yeah. An infrastructure that is hard to, to overcome. So one starts to believe in the infrastructure. I like this, I don't like this first. I am this, I am not this. That is, that's what. I am as good as the likes and dislikes. And it is on this basis that people get married also. They fill out what their likes and dislikes on, onto a computer profile and the other person also fills out. And this is how they, they get married also. But the likes and dislikes are constantly changing. And then what happens? One is left holding the bag. Yeah. This is why the Karma Yoga is very important because the reduction of the likes and dislikes are an important, you know, the, is an important precursor to the assimilation of knowledge. So this is Karma Yoga. And so this is one particular lifestyle that is granted in the Veda, in the Upanishad and in the Bhagavad Gita. It is a recognized lifestyle, a, a committed lifestyle which is called Karma Yoga. You do your job, you make Ishvara the center of your own universe, you dedicate your actions, reap the fruits thereof and you learn to accept everything that comes gladly. First grumblingly and then hopefully <laughs> gladly. <laughs> this is one committed lifestyle. The other committed lifestyle which was again talked about in the, the beginning of the, at the beginning of the third chapter was the, is what is Sankhya, a lifestyle where one takes the plunge. Yeah. You just drop off, really. You drop off as an actor. You declare to the universe that from this day forward you are only going to engage in the knowledge and nothing else. No other business is your business. And you give up all the roles, all responsibilities, all duties. Oh, that sounds very nice. You know, only for five minutes, that's all. You know? <laughs> Five minutes, it sounds very nice. After that, what? After that, one starts, suddenly gets restless because if one is not ready, then one cannot take on this particular lifestyle called Sankhya Yoga. And one cannot say, you know, and then and this was again described in chapter 5, where Arjuna is told by Krishna, you know, Sanyasastu Mahabahu Dukkham Aptum Ayogataha Without Karma Yoga Sanyasa is very difficult to have. In fact, even if you want to be a Sanyasi, you need to be a Karma Yogi first. Sanyasi means you have, you know, you just are there. You don't have, you can't control the universe, you can't do anything, you can't, you know, do anything other than study and teaching. That's all you do, basically. So, ayogataha, without yoga, sannyasastu, dukkham aptum, it is very difficult to achieve. But, yoga yukto munir brahma achirena adhigachati. But the one who is endowed with karma yoga, without any problem, gains that, that, that same sannyasa, gains that very easily. So, Karma Yoga is not just only a preparation for the receptivity to, to increase the receptivity for the knowledge. Karma Yoga is also a preparation for sannyasa, both. So now look at the question, which is better? <laughs> I'm turning 15, says the teenager. So should I become 16 or should I become 25? This is the question. <laughs> I just, um, my birthday is coming. I'm now 15. So on my birthday, should I turn 16 or 25? Is there a choice? No. So really speaking, so the, the two are not, it's like comparing oranges, apples, whatever you have. It's not, you can only compare two like things. The sannyasi is at a different level. Because the sannyasi has quelled the ragadveshas, the sannyasi is totally committed to the knowledge. The sannyasi has, does not have other irons in the fire. And in the Bhagavad Gita, the sannyasi is seen as, the, as a jnani, as one who is as good as the, received the knowledge. So sannyasi is a jnani. And so the karma yogi is a jnani wannabe. 
So what is the comparison between the two? And look at how, you know, Arjuna has put Lord Krishna in a quandary, like which is better? You know, those devotees, so now he's not asking about the lifestyle. He's asking about the mode of devotion. Very crafty fellow, very clever. Very nicely he has changed the tone and he is asking, are those devotees who worship you in a, in a form, in a particular form, and worship you as evam, as before? What is this as before? You have to turn to chapter 11 verse 55, where it says, the last verse, where it says, Mat karma krit, mat paramaha, mat bhaktaha. Sangha Varjitaha. The one who, Mat Karma Krit, one who surrenders all the actions for my sake alone. Mat Parama, Mat Parama, for whom I am the, 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 the only thing that is there. I am the most important person in whose life. Mat Bhaktaha, the one who is totally devoted to me. Sangha Varjitaha. You know, Nirvairaha Sarva Bhuteshu, sa Yahasa Mameti. Pandava was told. So, Sangha Varjitaha, free of involvement, free of attachment and Nirvairaha, free of enmity, any kind of enmity towards all the beings, comes to me alone, attains me. So, this is Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga for the gain of knowledge. It's not, it's an auxiliary means, the primary means for the gain of knowledge is Shravanam, listening to the and approaching a teacher and listening to the teacher. And then you can help yourself, you know, amplify the listening so that the listening is loud and clear. So that the Shravanam bears fruit and flower and blo blossoms in your heart by taking on to a life of Karma Yoga. So obviously in the 55th verse of the 11th chapter, the Karma Yogi is described by Bhagavan and the Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna says, the one who is totally devoted to me, to whom I am the paramount person, to who, who is the one who is, you know, completely with me and who does all works, all duties, keeping me in view alone. And that is the person who, who will gain me. That is the ultimate Bhakta. He's already said that. And then Arjuna says, okay, so somebody worships you in that manner, meaning as a karma yogi, you see, he's not asking about devotion. He's asking, somebody who worships you by doing all actions worshipfully and prayerfully, is that person superior or is the person who sees you as themselves, as the <laughs> ultimate, is that person superior? As the non-objectified truth of the self, is that person superior? And Adi Shankara in the commentary of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, is as adept as, as Krishna is in, 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 in bypassing this question completely. Adi Shankara says, Tishthantu Tavat means let us not confuse the jnanis, the people who are knowledgeable, with the people who are still wanting to or in the process of gaining the knowledge. Let us leave the sannyasis out of it completely. <laughs> <laughs> Adi Shankara says and he is actually saying what Krishna has done here he is giving a, a form to what happened here because the answer to the question is very beautiful and so Adi Shankara says Tishtantute, let them be don't bring them into the equation because you cannot compare so, you, know, you, go, you know 16 going on 25 is not a possibility <laughs> so therefore you know this is not the comparison it, it, itself those people are not part of this comparison because one is the means and the other they have gained the ends. So therefore you cannot compare the people who are still struggling with the means of thinking what to ad adapt with those who have already achieved the end. And so therefore let us look at the question differently. Let us look at the karma yogis themselves and divide them into two. And this is what is there in uh, Arjuna, uh, in, in Bhagavan Krishna's answer also, it will be there. Let us look at the karma yogis themselves and divide them into two. The ones who do kevala karma, what is kevala karma? Only karma. Karma yoga. Only action. 
which includes worship by the way. Don't think only action means they are just sitting and eating and cooking worshipfully. No. It also includes daily worship. That is part of it. And then the second ones are those who also in addition to doing karma yoga also find time for meditation. <laughs> so let us compare the two and see which is better. This is what Adi Shankara says in introducing Bhagavan Krishna's answer. Let us take a look. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Maya Vesya Mano Ye Maam Maya Vesya Mano Ye Maam Nitya Yukta Upasate Nitya Yukta Upasate Shraddhaya Parayo Petaha Shraddhaya Parayo Petaha Te me yukta tamamata Te me yukta tamamata Again, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Maya Vesya Mano Ye Maam Maya Vesya Mano Ye Maam Nitya Yukta Nitya Upasate Nitya Yukta Upasate Shraddhaya Parayo Petaha Shraddhaya Parayo Petaha Te Me Yukta Tamamata Te Me Yukta Tamamata So Shri Bhagavan said Uvacha. What did he say? Mayi Aveshya Manaha Ye Maam Upasate Nitya Yuktaha So Nitya Yuktaha means the ones who have, who are always committed to me, whose minds are committed to me. Upasate, the ones who pray, the ones who meditate upon me, whose minds are committed to me. Mayi Aveshya, being always one with me. And Shraddhaya Parayo Petaha, endowed with unflinching Shraddha, meaning the devotion and the reverence is there all the time. They are considered by me as the most exalted. You know, very non-committal answer, correct? <coughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the karma yogi here is, is eulogized by Bhagavan. It's not what they do or the mode of devotion that matters. It's the fact that they are devoted in everything that they do. It's not how many times they pray, but that they do every action prayerfully is what is most important. It's not that they are doing this or that. It's not the mode of devotion. It's the fact that they are devoted which is more important than the mode of devotion. And this is something which is interesting because all of Bhagavan Krishna's answers are like this from the beginning. Mm. In the third chapter he asks, what does he ask? Which is better, karma yoga or sannyasa? And you are saying knowledge frees karma binds yet you are asking me to do karma, what should I do? Tell me the correct thing, one thing to do. And Bhagavan says, in this world there are two committed lifestyles. So he's not answering the question, he's, he's answering the spirit of the question. Same thing happens in fifth chapter. Same thing happens also in the second chapter when he requests Bhagavan, when Arjuna requests Bhagavan Krishna to elucidate the characteristics of a wise person. 
How does the wise, how to recognize a wise person? How does the wise person sit, stand, walk, talk? If one is not wise, one is otherwise, <laughs> then one cannot recognize a wise person, you know. And if one is wise, one does not need these, the answer to recognize a wise person. So therefore, Bhagavan again transcends the question and answers the spirit of the question. And what is the spirit of the question? What is it that makes the wise person a wise person? And the answer was given, Atmani eva atmana santushtaha. The one that is happy. The one who is happy without any external props or any external devices, nothing. One who is happy being themselves totally. That is the wise person. Atmani eva atmana tushtaha. Santushtaha. Sthitadihi munihi uchyate. In the second chapter, that was described. So here too again, mahi aveshya manaha ye maam paryupasate. The ones who meditate upon me, the ones who, the ones who meditate upon me are considered by me as the most exalted. And it's not just enough to meditate. They also have unflinching devotion. And they are always committed to me. And they are always one with me. Because they are. It's not that Bhagavan is an object of thought here. Bhagavan is not something that is enclosed by a thought. But here what is it? In the awareness of the Karma Yogi. It's always for the sake of Bhagavan. It is always... For the sake of moksha, it is always for the sake of overcoming ragadveshas. So the kind of connection, it is where the person has made the connection with Bhagavan real. Yeah, that is something which is very important in the tradition to assimilate this knowledge. Because this is not, because the subject is who? I. And what is the object of the Vedantic study? To know Ishvara as I. The I in I and the I in the word Ishvara is one. This is what I have to know. And a lot of people come to Vedanta thinking that I can bypass Ishvara and I can go straight to Brahman. Yeah. You know, they had their, what is that, they, they have the plane which goes past the sound barrier, it's like that. You know, somehow this Ishvara is not, you know, because there is Ishvara allergy. You say Ishvara and some scratch, itch starts to happen. This is real. Because of our own projections, one's own projection. Ishvara, like for Arjuna, became an object of fear. Mm. Because he was already afraid, it brought out the fear of that whole insecurity that was already residing in him. And he's, in his view, Bhagavan was something different from him and therefore he got even more afraid. And for some people think that Bhagavan is some kind of an authority figure, like mother and father who were not perfect. Mother and father are never perfect. You know? And so therefore what? And so Bhagavan is somebody who the mother and father also disappointed and Bhagavan is also disappointing and therefore they, they want to bypass Bhagavan. This the whole understanding of God is not there. God as what? As the truth of yourself. As the one that is manifest as everything in everything. The whole entire world is pervaded by which truth which is non-separate from you. That is what we call Bhagavan. It is not an object, it is very much a subject. It is not separate from the subject which is yourself. But not knowing this, Bhagavan becomes an object to be believed. It is not for us, it is not a matter of belief. It is a matter of cognition, assimilating the knowledge. But then why is it not sufficient, people think. For me to know that I am Brahman, why do I have to bring this Ishvara in the... Isn't Vedanta all about Brahma Vidya? It is not Ishvara Vidya, it is Brahma Vidya. 
सो इफ इट्स ब्रह्म विद्या नॉलेज ऑफ ब्रह्मन सो आई शुड जस्ट बी हैप्पी नोइंग आई एम ब्रह्मन इट इज नॉट इट इज नॉट अनफ इन फैक्ट मोक्षा डजेंट यू नो इट दैट इज नॉट वट इज कंसिडर्ड फ्रीडम मोक्षा बिकॉज यू आर ब्रह्मन मीन्स वॉट इफ द वेव इज टोल्ड यू आर वॉटर दैट्स नॉट एनलाइटनमेंट द वेव हैज टू बी टोल्ड यू आर द ओशन and that you think you are finite is just a notion because in fact you are the ocean the wave has to be told that and only then is there enlightenment is there the feeling uh, of getting rid of that smallness if the wave is told you are just water that's not you know that doesn't make it it's all it's a known fact yes i am present yes that i is awareness that is consciousness and the name for that consciousness is brahman okay big d but what kind of brahman the brahman that is the same as the cause of the universe ha huh? that is when the 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 whole we have come the full circle and so the mahavakya every you know sentence that that unfolds this vision in the upanishads equates the jiva with ishvara not with brahman even though it is called brahma vidya so this has to be properly understood and if this is not understood then you know then the whole ishvara is not understood and if ishvara is not understood what moksha you know what is the moksha there only moka you can have you know you can go to starbuck or wherever and have moka moksha you cannot have moksha means a feeling of relief from this samsara where everything that uh, that that this whole manifest universe including this body mind sense complex is seen as a projection is seen for what it is as a projection as a projection not a projection in time and at a particular place no where time and space are also part of this projection it includes the time space matrix is part of this projection and i have to be able to see that and in order to see that you cannot see that directly immediately because one brings one's own flawed infrastructure flawed by ragadvesha flawed by so many vasanas flawed by so many things one brings an infrastructure that comes in the way of this vision so we have to take some steps you know first you have to know what this ishvara is because okay you cannot bypass <laughs> in the west that is why you know we find that you know buddhism becomes very popular because it is silent of the question of ishvara apparently the buddha was asked is there god and he kept quiet <laughs> maybe he was trying to say that god is not an object you know or who knows because we don't know and so therefore the there is you know there is no talk of god in buddhism and it becomes very popular especially with the disenchanted you know those people in the west who are very disenchanted by religion and the kind of the concept of god that one is constantly recovering from that's why when people introduce themselves to me they always say i'm a recovering catholic i've never met a recovered catholic <laughs> i'm yet to meet <laughs> because there the concept of god is very mixed up it is our own projection even though the bible says god made man in his image actually we make god in our own image he is loving okay but be careful loving but be careful because suddenly some you know some bad things can happen and therefore what you know therefore you don't know what is this god is it god the father or god father you know sometimes there is no there is no difference between the two and so the people are very disenchanted extremely disenchanted because they don't want to deal with god at all but then the 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 cry for the for spirituality doesn't leave the person because this is a very important quest it is the fundamental and the most basic quest of a human being and so what do what happens you know so they want something where they don't have to deal with god understandable understandable i can see why i, I can clearly see why but really speaking the god that vedanta is talking about is teaching about is not other than you this is what has to be understood so i have to make peace with the universe in which i live 
I have to make peace with the universe starting with my own body mind sense complex. This body is given to me. You know mother did not make this body. Even though the mother, the body grew in the body of the mother. This body grew in the body of the mother. Mother doesn't know how to make bodies. You ask your mother, do you know how to make kidneys? She will say, Beta, I know how to make kidney beans, not kidneys. <laughs> That's how it is, you know. Do you know how to make lungs? No. So the body is given. Mind is given. Ability to see things is given. Hands are given, legs are given, voice is given, brain is given. The capacity to decide or to do this or that is given, choice is given. And then this whole universe is given. Everything is given. Light, sound, you know, rain, water, food to eat, everything is given. Then of course the question arises, is there a giver? If there is a giver, then I better get to know this giver. What is this giver? I better get to have a relationship with this giver. Especially if I am seeking this to know that I am non-separate from that giver. I have to get to know the giver. You know, we have to go baby steps, correct? So I have to get to know the giver. And getting to know the giver is called settling accounts with Ishvara. This is what it is. Because all the pain of the childhood, all the fears, all the sorrows, all the difficulties, all the authority issues and all the things that I could not say yes to because I am opposing it all the time. That oppositional, you know, way of greeting the world, there has to be some altar at which I can lay all this this ninja stance. Ninja means the one who is having a shield in one hand and a sword in the other. Always like this, you know. Protective, defensive, offensive. Yeah. This is the ninja. Vulnerable, insecure. This is the person who wants to assimilate Vedanta. How is that possible without seeing what is it that is that you are equated to? In the vision, the jiva, oneself, the individual is equated to Ishvara. So who is this Ishvara? Kidrishosi. Who, how, how do you look? What are you like? Where are you? In fact, the question is, where are you not? And, you know, for Prahalada, a devotee, this, you know, the, the Bhagavan manifested, break, broke through a pillar because his father was being a dictator and questioned the existence of Bhagavan because he, he had this hubris that I am everything. Why don't you pray to me? He asked this small boy. He says, you are just father. He is the father of the universe. Vishnu, I pray to Vishnu. Shut up. You should only pray to me. I am the most powerful person. Say Hiranyaya Namaha. Don't say, you know, Vishnave Namaha. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. You don't say. You say, Hiranyaya Namaha. And the boy refuses to say, Hiranyaya Namaha. He says, no, you are just father. I am praying to that which is the father of you also. The father of everything. And uh, he says, where is your God? What can he do for you? He's everywhere. Oh, he's everywhere. He's in this pillar too. Yes, he's in this pillar too. And he breaks open the pillar. And a horrendous form of Bhagavan emerges. Yeah. To, to give justice to this to this tyrant. Half man, half lion. Why? Because this tyrant had obtained a boon. The story goes that I will not be killed by either man or animal. <laughs> so therefore, half man, half lion. I will not be killed in the house or out of the house. So therefore, the threshold was, pretty, was made just for this. <laughs> That's why we don't do anything at the threshold. You don't exchange things at the threshold. You don't greet people at the threshold. You either go outside or they come in. Threshold <laughs> is a dangerous place. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then I should not be killed either in the morning or in the at night. Either during the day or during the night. So it was the time of twilight. And I should not be killed on the ground or in the air. You know. And so 
the lap of the Lord was a wonderful place. <laughs> and with his nails he, you know, tore the stomach. The stomach is the seat of the ego. Yeah, the head and the stomach. This is called Manipura Chakra, the navel. The navel is the first eye. You see, when the navel cord is cut, that is when the eye starts to exist separately. So that is, it's all metaphoric. So this Bhagavan, I have to understand, I have to know. So beautiful, I have to see what is this. What is the truth behind these stories? What is it? It is that I am being equated to. And so one has to find it and alter where one surrenders, one's pains, sorrows, despondencies, disenchantments and disappointments. And that altar then has, is imbued with a power because it is a very powerful altar. That altar is actually all. That altar has the power to alter you so that you are able to see the truth of yourself. So having this relationship with Bhagavan is very important. And for this reason, the study of the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is, 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 you know, very, very essential. Without this, we cannot get there. And so we can understand Arjuna's question also in this light, you know. So if I go straight to the formless, <laughs> seems easy. You, you take the escalator to the formless. How are you going to meditate upon the formless? There is some kind of a disjunct here. You know, how are you going to visualize the formless? Tell me. You know, <laughs> I meditate upon the formless God. Already you have given a form. You know, you can't really visualize the formless. You can't meditate upon the formless. And so, uh, his question that there might be a batch of devotees who are meditating upon the formless. Really, the, the only way to meditate upon the formless, the, the formless is not an object for meditation, it is the very subject. It is to contemplate on the words of the Shastra to re repeatedly so th that you keep seeing that its meaning. That is what it is. That is what medi contemplation is. So why don't I go straight to the contemplation bit and forget these rituals and this, you know, bonding with God and then, you know, what is this, you know, some super glue or what, you know. Well, let's forget all these little upacharas, little kind of, you know, rituals. And some people come and tell me, we are Vedantins, why do we have to go to temple, you know. Why do we have to pray? Why do we have to do all these things? You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to eat dinner, you know. <laughs> Why do you have to eat dinner? You know, what's the use? Because in the morning you will want breakfast again. So, <laughs> what's the use? So, like this, you know, that is not an excuse. You have to see what is it that I am being equated to. And if I am being e equated to the cause of the universe, I better become aware of how this cause operates and what is my connection to this cause on the level of the transactional reality called this Jagat. More we shall see on, on Thursday. Thursday at 6, 6 o'clock uh, Pacific time. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nath Pur Namada Chate Pur Nasya Pur Namada Gapur Nameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Vyo Namaha Hari Om I will take one or two questions. Ishvara and Brahman are one and the same, but the feeling is that Brahman is that which is, you know, which is the truth of Ishvara and the truth of Jiva. But as far as we are concerned, Ishvara and Brahman are one and the same. How do we go about putting down all the pain on the altar? Just like that, you have to just imagine setting it, literally, physically you imagine looking, looking at the altar and saying, here I dedicate all this pain and sorrow to you, you know, please help me 
overcome this. I don't want to have this anymore. I want to move on. You have to actually say it. Um, can I say that Ishvara being Saguna Brahma and, be, and being all pervading means I am okay with myself and my life? Yeah, sure, you can say that. Wonderful. Any other questions? Any questions here? Okay. Om Namah Shivaya.